When I was 15, my parents bought an island. No, they didn't win the lottery and run off to some pristine tropical isle, but I think they would have wanted to. Instead, they worked long hours, saved every penny, and found a small island for sale. Located in an inlet on the northeast coast of the United States, the island was just big enough for one small cottage and, according to the ad, had been mainly used as a summer rental. My parents wanted to move in year-round, and they made the final purchase just before I started my sophomore year of high school. I can't say I was thrilled to be whisked away from the town I grew up in and the friends I'd had since kindergarten, but it was my parents' lifelong dream and I couldn't let them down. The island was far enough away that we didn't get a chance to visit before we moved in. Mom and Dad fell in love with it based on pictures alone, and I, well, I just went along with it. Summer was fading fast when we moved in. The days were warm, but the nights carried a bite of cold. Luckily, the cottage was furnished, so all we needed to carry over on the bare metal motorboat was clothing and necessities, along with a small selection of kitchen utensils. As we crossed the water, I compared the pictures from the ad to the reality of the island. The water was murkier, the island smaller, and the air was heavier. That's strange to say, isn't it? How you can tell what the air should feel like from a picture, but that's just how it was. The pictures of the cottage looked sunny and fresh, but in person, it felt like a smothering haze hung over the island. My mother and father didn't pick up on what I had sensed. On the contrary, they got more excited the closer we got to the island. Mom could barely contain herself as Dad docked the boat. She leapt from the craft the second we reached the old rundown pier and ran up the hill to the cottage. I met up with her inside as Dad tied and inspected the boat on shore. Elijah, Mom said, this will be your room. She was on the second floor at the landing, watching me with misty eyes. I got an odd feeling looking at her, like she'd been out of place her whole life, and now she was somewhere she finally belonged. No kidding, I said. That's like the only room in the house. It was almost true. There was a small but open main floor, and then an even smaller second floor with just two bedrooms. A wooden balcony let you look down into the main part of the house. It was furnished like my Graham's house, with crocheted blankets draped over the cushy couches and way too many throw pillows. A dusty wicker rocking chair sat opposite a puke green velvet footstool. The whole house smelled damp and musty. I wanted to complain about a billion things, but one look at my mom's face and I knew she was happier than she'd been in some time. I kept my mouth shut and dumped my bag in my new bedroom. Later that evening, I glanced out the window. Mom and Dad were down at the shore holding hands. I hadn't seen them so affectionate towards each other in years. I chuckled to myself as Dad kissed Mom and then pushed her playfully into the shallow water. Mom retaliated by splashing Dad relentlessly until he was just as soaked as she was. In public, this would have honestly been embarrassing for me. But now, in the seclusion of our new island home, it was kind of nice. I still had my reservations about living on this island, but I'd try to get over it. Even so, I never quite made myself at home in the cottage. I didn't unpack my clothes. Instead, I just lived out of my suitcase. The kitschy paintings remained on the walls. I didn't bother getting out my Jane's Addiction posters and memoirs from home. Soon, school started, and the extra boat trip across the lake took up more of my morning and evening than I'd hoped. The boat stop was visible from the pier. And more than once, I saw the flash of yellow approaching just as I scrambled down the dock, catching the school bus by the skin of my teeth. I was always a quiet kid, still am, and I managed to get through classes without drawing too much attention to myself. There were some classmates I felt I could get along with, and maybe I would have put more effort into making friends if things hadn't started getting strange at home. It was little things at first. Dad would be a half hour late bringing the boat to pick me up from the bus, and he wouldn't tell me what had kept him so long. He worked from home now, so I chalked it up to him getting distracted by his job. Then, I noticed Mom's long hair was always damp and stringy, like she'd just gotten out of the shower and hadn't dried or styled it. That's not such a big deal, except she'd always been so prim and proper, her hair one of her prized features. 
The next thing I noticed was dad's abnormally clammy hand as he clapped me on the shoulder and said, Good job, son. When I showed him my calc test, I know that sounds crazy that I'd be bothered by one clammy pat on the back, but it sent such a shudder through me that I just couldn't help but say something. Did you just take a shower? I asked. Not since last night, Dad replied. Why? I looked at his hand. His fingers were pale and pruney. Were you swimming? Something flickered across Dad's face, and he smiled. Of course not. The water's freezing. Huh, I said, dismissing the subject. But after that, I remained observant. At dinner that night, I noticed Mom's hands were pruny too, and her hair was damp again. I'd been in the house the whole time, so I knew she hadn't used the sink or shower recently. Had they actually been swimming in the frigid water? And if so, why would they lie about it? And why was it bothering me so much? The next week or so was uneventful, although it seemed like every time I saw my parents, they looked like they'd just been in the water. They were evasive, but on the surface, they were the same old mom and dad I'd always known. I decided to let it go. Until the first day of October, I'd just gotten off the school bus and sighed when I saw dad wasn't waiting for me. His lateness had gotten worse, so I can't say I was too surprised. But what did surprise me was that when I walked to the dock to try and see him coming, the boat was already there, tied up at the dock. I peered through the surrounding trees, but dad was nowhere in sight. Our car had a permanent spot in the lot by the pier, but I could see the red station wagon clearly. Dad had not taken the car somewhere. I silently griped, wishing dad wasn't so behind the times that he had a cell phone. Dad? I called out hoping he was within earshot. No response. I swung my backpack off my shoulder and waited for dad to return. Night fell, and my teeth began to chatter. I was really getting worried. Finally, I hopped in the motorboat and sped across the water to home. The lights were on when I reached the cottage. I sped up the hill and burst through the door, startling my mother who was cooking in the kitchen. Have you heard from dad? I asked. I think something might have happened to him. What are you talking about, Eli? Mom asked as she ran a clammy, wrinkled hand down my cheek. Your father's fine. He's right here. I turned to my right, and sure enough, Dad sat at the kitchen table, stirring his tea. I froze, partly from the familiar, horrible shudder that ran through me at the touch of my mother's wet hand, and partly at the impossibility of the situation. How did you get here? I asked. What do you mean? The boat. You left it tied up on the mainland after you dropped me off at the bus this morning. That's our only boat. How'd you get back? My father's face was unreadable. Don't you worry about that, Elijah. But I was frustrated. What, what did you do? Swim back? The second those words left my mouth... A frightening expression crossed Dad's face. He grinned at me, not saying a word and not taking his unblinking eyes off me. And then for the first time, I noticed the pool of water under his feet. I stepped backwards, right into a similar puddle beneath my mother. Something was going on, something I didn't understand the extent of yet. I guess I still don't know the full story even now, but maybe it's better that way. I grabbed my books and shut myself in my room, feeling mom and dad's eyes on me as I went. I woke up in the middle of the night, feeling very strongly like I'd heard my name being called just seconds before I awoke. I didn't hear my name again, but I tuned in to another sound, water lapping against the shore. That was strange. The island was small, but not so small that I should hear that from my room. Puzzled, I got out of bed and went downstairs. The lights were off. Mom and Dad must have been asleep. The sound of water was closer, and I could swear I heard a faint whispering as well. I crossed the living room and paused ever so briefly at the front door before opening it. Peering out into the dark, I had to blink a few times before I was sure what I was seeing. It looked like the island had flooded, 
only there'd been no recent storms, not even a drizzle. The water was calm and flat, and it came right up to the door. It was dark, so dark that I couldn't even see the wooden porch that should be barely an inch below the surface. Moonlight glinted off it, and as my eyes adjusted, I could see out across the island. Well, all I could see of the island was trees jutting out of the water. It was a good thing our house was on the highest point of land, otherwise it would have been underwater too. Across the water, just past a clump of trees, came a strange giggling. I think I might have been scared if I weren't half convinced this was all a dream. I'm still not sure. But I narrowed my eyes, trying to see who or what was laughing from out in the darkness. It sounded like two separate voices. And then I saw two heads, half submerged below the water, swim out from behind the trees. They were turned away from me so I couldn't see their faces, but who else could it be other than my mom and dad? Why were they swimming out in the flood? The quiet splashes of the water seemed to mesmerize me, and a thought crossed my mind. Why don't I join them? I almost took a step into the murky water when a second thought hit me. That outcropping of trees where my parents were swimming was on the north side of the hill which rose to about as high as the main floor of the house. The water couldn't be deeper than an inch or two in that spot. How could my parents be swimming there with all but their heads beneath the surface? Something was horribly unnatural about the whole situation, and I began to shake as the two half-submerged heads turned towards me. Mom and Dad stared hungrily at me, and they began to rise from the water. I slammed the door shut and ran back to my room, locking it behind me and hiding under the covers. And the next thing I knew, it was morning. Sunlight streamed through the window, erasing any fear I'd felt from that strange dream. I looked at my alarm clock and cursed when I realized I'd slept in. If I hurried, though, I could still catch the bus. I threw on my clothes and called for my dad. My voice echoed through the house, but I didn't hear a response. I didn't hear any sounds at all. Hey, Dad, you gotta take me to the bus. Silence. I checked their room. The bed was empty. Rushing out the door, backpack in hand, I ran down to the dock, and the boat was gone. Had they gone somewhere without me? I shook my head. They'd barely set foot on the mainland since we'd moved. Plus, why would they leave me here on a school day? I ran around the tiny island, but there was no sign of my parents. After some time, I ended up back at the dock. Across the water, I saw a flash of yellow as the school bus drove up to the bus stop, paused, and continued down the street. I slumped down on the ground, and the horror from last night flooded back into my mind. I could clearly see mom and dad's faces in my memory as they rose from the water. There was something terribly wrong with them. At the same time, I chided myself. It was just a dream. Of course the island didn't flood overnight. The ground was as cold and dry as it had ever been. But then where were my parents? I went back to the house and waited for them to return home. They hadn't returned to the island by nightfall, and I was at a loss for what to do. So rather than do much at all, I went to my room, and after several restless hours, I fell asleep. I awoke with a sense of dread. I kept my eyes closed, though I could tell it was still dark out. My scalp tingled, and I recognized a chilling sound. The lapping of water. Right behind me. I shot straight up in bed and looked around. My room was flooded, but how? I was on the second floor. Feeling numb, I surveyed the room. The water had risen to just barely above floor level, and it sloshed ominously around the legs of my bed. And then my hair stood on end as I heard a familiar giggling. <laughs> it was close. There was splashing coming from my closet. I jumped and cowered on the furthest corner of my bed. I strained my eyes, trying to see in the darkness. There was a stirring, a flutter of movement from behind the closet door. And then I watched in horror as two heads swam out from the shadows. 
the water coming to just above their lips. Mom and Dad, it was impossible. My parents looked like they were swimming in deep water, but it couldn't be. Not in my barely flooded bedroom. But there they were, advancing towards me in the dark water. Mom was the closest, and our eyes locked. I couldn't turn away. As the first wave of ripples hit my bed frame, I snapped out of my trance. I tried to jump away, but my feet caught in my sheets. With a sharp yelp, I toppled off the bed. I expected to hit the hard, wet floor, but instead I plunged into deep water. The cold shocked my system, and for an agonizing minute, I couldn't tell which way was up. I floundered, kicking helplessly, and finally broke the surface. Sputtering, I looked around. I was in the middle of the inlet, far from shore. I had no clue how I'd gotten there, but as the cold set into my joints, I knew I had to reach solid ground or I'd drown. Clouds had blotted out the moon, but I saw lights from the island, no sign of flooding I might add, and began to swim towards it. Then my common sense kicked in. I couldn't go back. The mainland was much, much further, but I just couldn't bring myself to return to the cottage. Turning away from the island, I started to make my way to safety. I wasn't a very athletic guy, and I began to tire quickly. My muscles weakened and then cramped, and I thought I wouldn't make it. Still far from shore, my progress slowed to a stop. I floated in the pitch black water, both physically and mentally exhausted. I wasn't going to make it. At least that's what I was thinking when I felt it. A soft brushing of fingers down my leg. I flailed wildly and almost sunk below the surface in panic. What finally got my limbs kicking properly was the sight of a graying hand reaching toward me. The next thing I knew, I was dragging myself up the rusty dock ladder. I'd made it. The relief didn't last long as I realized I'd have to explain to someone what had happened. Good thing I was a decent liar. The next few months of my life were filled with legal matters and investigations as my parents were never seen again. Well, almost never. It's been a few years since that incident and I finally got my life back on track. I moved out of my Graham's house into my own apartment, and I now balance my life between work and classes. But something odd has been happening the past few nights. I wake up in the dead of night, with this odd feeling like someone said my name. At first, I ignored it and went to sleep. But last night, I heard giggling outside my window. <laughs> I got out of bed to take a look. The street below was flooded, but barely, and there, in the yellow glow of the street lamp, were two heads just peeking out of the surface of the water. They want me to return home. <laughs>